If I use this, does, it make me, does this make me look worldly? <laughs> a little small. Actually, it's like that. Yeah. Okay. The earth is tilted, which is why you get seasons. It's why you get a winter solstice and a summer solstice. God designed it this way. I, li I love studying the real way God created everything and uh, because you get understanding out of it. If you flatten it, and make it against the Bible, you don't get any understanding out of it. But if you study it the way it is, and understand that God made it this way, when you see that the sun not only rises in the east and goes down in the west, but it also rises from the south to the north and back to the south again, and does that every year. It takes six months for it to rise, and six months for it's to set. That's where you get the winter and summer solstice. That's where you get the tropics. Because it rises from the tropic of... I can never get those two right. The tropic of... You have cancer? Really? Oh, the tropic of cancer. I'm sorry. Rises from the tropic of cancer to the tropic of Capricorn. Six months. And then it goes back down to the tropic of cancer again. And at the equinox, equa has the word equal in it, which is the blue packets, not the pink ones. <laughs> You'll get that. But at the equator, on the equinoxes, the sun is directly overhead, straight up, 90 degrees, at exactly noon. And... The globe model accounts for that. That's how we understand it. The flat earth doesn't, doesn't understand that. It doesn't account for that. They have to do some really weird and goofy things with the sun to get that to work out right. And it still doesn't, it still doesn't account for everything because it doesn't account for the temperature differences in the seasons. So their sun has to spin like this, and it has to go up and down this way, away and toward the earth to make the temperature change. It just doesn't work. Yes, JR? The earth is tilted. The earth, that they say the earth is flat when they get like Yeah, cats would throw everybody off the edge of it. No, they would all be caught on the ice wall that they say is it the NR? It doesn't make, it's not real. It's not true. All right. Take your Bible, turn to Mark. Let's study something that is true. Mark chapter 3, actually, Matthew 12, and then Mark 3, Luke 11. We'll just look at these very quickly because we want to get into the message. And this question arose as... Uh, a couple Sunday nights ago, how do devils take over a person's will? How do devils do that? Uh, do they just randomly pick people and say, I'm going to get you, and then just take them over? No. A person resigns their will by what they're doing. Okay? In other words... You willingly walk into their trap. Because they will set a trap for you. They'll set a trap for every man in this building, every man listening to me, every woman, and every child. Um, how you doing, Sandy? We have two Sandys. Sandy, meet Sandy. <laughs> Sandy, that's Sandy. Okay? Uh, the other family that visited with us this morning, the Colstons, uh, their son has an awesome YouTube channel. And I'm going to post a link to it this week. He has a gift for... Um, he has produced certain dramatic... How do I describe it? 
I'm going to use the word cartoon, but that's not really what it is. And it's not like Looney Tunes cartoons. He has, he has done things with graphic illustrations and his voice. He has an amazing talent at his age to use his voice to illustrate certain aspects of the gospel. And I started watching it this afternoon, and I'm hooked already. And, uh, and I, told his, I told him to his face, and he was embarrassed about it. He's very shy about it. But uh, I told his dad, I said, he's got a gift. And I want to try to promote. I'm all about promoting the good guys. And uh, this is why I had Brother Edge on this week with his book. And um, I've got a box of books for anybody here that wants them. Now, we have to charge for them because he's going to charge us for them because it costs him. He's got to get his money back. But... Um, uh, how many pages are in his book? 500 some odd? And uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's an expensive book. If we were to make it, it would be an expensive book to make. So anyway, uh, I'm all about just promoting the good guys. And then his dad, Micah, I have books on my couch on the King James issue that I'm going to go through, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to promote them as well. Um, whoever the guys are that are telling the truth... They're doing it differently than I am, but they're doing it, and I don't mind promoting that. So, uh, but anyway, Matthew, Matthew 12, Mark 3, and, and uh, Luke 11, that's going to get us started, and then I want to get into the, the, the issue, this is how devils get in, all right? So, he starts out in Matthew 12, verse 22, then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind, and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils, Jesus knew their thoughts. I love, that's one of my favorite things about Jesus, is that he knew their thoughts. And the reason why he knew that is that he created the brain. It was by Jesus that God created everything that is. So Jesus was well aware of the thought processes of man. He created man. He is the Word of God, and the Word of God always knows us. When you read your Bible, your Bible is seeing into you while you're reading it. And so he knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, uh, whom do you, whom do your children cast them out? Or by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. Uh, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Now, this is how it happens right here. Verse 29. I'm going to get my pen out if I can. There we go. Or... Else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his good, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? So that's how the devils could come in. They bind the strong man. The strong man is your will, your freedom of choice. All right. God has given humans something that he's not given the rest of creation. Angels don't even have this. Angels do not have free will. God has. It's like he's pre-programmed them to do what he wants them to do. This is how he knows what Satan's going to do. He's programmed Satan to do what he's doing. So he can turn Satan, it's, it's like in Revelation 9, I believe the star that falls from heaven is Satan. I may be wrong in that, it could be wrong, it could be a different evil angel. But he has, to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Why did Jesus give this particular angel the key of the bottomless pit? Because he knew it would do exactly what he did, and that is fall down and open up the pit with it. Why did he, Jesus do that? He, because he wanted that done. Because he knows what those angels that are down in that pit, he knows what they're going to do when they come out. 
It's because he's designed them to do that. Everything is in God's hands. Don't worry. Don't worry so much about how you're afraid things are going to turn out. Things are going to turn out the way God wanted them to turn out. Get on God's side and you won't have to worry so much about everything. Now, there are things that cause us grief. There are things that grieve the Holy Spirit. That's just the way things are. But at least you know that God is still operating in God mode. Okay? God is operating exactly the way God knows everything's going to turn out. So he says in Mark 3, 27, uh, No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto you the sins of men, and blasphemies whosoever, or wherewith soever, they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Luke 11. Verse 21, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he, guys pay attention to this. There are things that are stronger than you. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. Once he takes the armor away, he can have, he can bind the strong man and then have his house. So, this is how devils enter into a person. They bind the person's free will. But how do they do that? Uh, they remove the armor. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God. And now you turn to Ephesians 6. Let's pray. And then we'll, we'll, from Ephesians 6, we'll start, we'll move forward. But the, the purpose of what I'm teaching you is so that you will be aware of your strong man. Your strong man is your freedom to choose. But if your strong man, if you allow your strong man to be put into bondage, it's your choice. You want it that way, you'll get it that way, but you're, then you're going to lose your freedom of choice. Devils are going to do things with you that you, have, you cannot stop them. Right now, you can put a stop to what devils are doing. You have to resist them. You have to withstand them. You have to stand against them. And it may take a while, but eventually they'll leave. Because there is a greater in you than the one that is in the world greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world and that's the only way that you can withstand these devils and you have to have the armor on but the whole purpose of principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness is to get you to lay down your armor then they can overtake you and bind the strong man and then rule your house. Husbands, patriarchs, think of your house and think of areas where you know devils are coming in. Okay? It's very important teaching. Very, very important. Let's go to the prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you, we trust your word, and we trust and we learn from it. And God, there are things that we need to know. God, there are things that you wanted to teach me, and, but you had to lead me through things in order to get me to understand it. And God, I have a lot of regrets, but the things that you have taught me, I don't regret those things. Because now I'm able to teach others the things that you taught me and the things that I learned uh, from the things that you taught me. I wish, God, that you could have taught me a different way, but you know me. And there was only one way to teach Mike Hoggard, and that is the hard way. So, Father, I thank you, God, that while I was kicking and screaming 
you were dragging me through things to show me things that I could show others. So, Father, in that, I'm very, very thankful and very grateful. Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd bless each and every man, bless each and every householder, house band, everyone that's in authority, in every area of authority. Help us, dear God, to maintain that authority because that's the target. I pray, dear God, that you'd just give us light, give us wisdom, give us blessing. Thank you, Lord, for the things that we have endured. And teach us greater things than these. We ask in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God, verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. It may not occur to you, but the greatest thing that you have ever done in life was to stand. That may not be... Everybody's got a purpose in the body of Christ and you may think that the ones who, are, who have the biggest mouth have the greatest blessing, but it's not true. It could very well be that the ones who have caused and helped the body to stand have the greatest blessing on them because they enabled us to stand. It takes strong legs, but it also, those little toes... Your big toe and your little toe, your little toe actually is one doing most of the work. As my body leans in any given direction, it's my little toe that is keeping my body up. It's that inner ear, that, that gyroscope that's in my ear, the little bubble system that evolution did not make. It is so insane to think that millions and millions and millions of Accidents produced an inner ear system that lets the brain know which way the body is leaning so that the little toe can cause the body to... I don't... I don't it's stupid. Amen? I, Chris, I love it when you laugh because I know, I know you get it. Chris's way of saying amen is... <laughs> amen! I'll take it. So, let's look at principalities tonight. Principalities are, they are chief devils, kings over devils, chiefs over certain locations, areas. They have an area that they govern over. They are chiefs over nations, over peoples, over tribes. This may be way, why all nations serve different gods with different names. Think about it. Um, every every uh, civilization that has not served our God, they all have a sun god. But that sun god has a different name in every area. Um... Every civilization that has risen up has served different gods with different names. So it may be that those gods were the principalities, were the princes over those particular people. Um, but every location, every nation, every location in the world has had a prince ruling over it, ruling over them. So the Bible is telling you that, number one, there are principalities, devils that have authority or have been given authority by the people that they rule over. Let me show you from the Bible. Ezekiel 28, 2. Son of man, say unto the prince... Of Tyrus. Now we know that Tyrus, Tyre, T Y R E, which is how they spell Tyre in Kenya, T I R E. Our spelling, T I R E, they spell it T Y R E in Kenya. Am I right on that, Michael? What? Now, listen here. 
I've seen the gas stations selling tires. T Y. I see I'm right. Now I'm getting a smile. You ought to see that white smile up against that green wall up there. I, I can tell I got it right. But there was a, an area called Tyre. And this prophecy is both to the king of Tyre. The literal king. But it's also over the devil that controlled that king. Does that make sense? So when you have the, the knowledgeable Bible scholars who looked at this and say, of course this is not against Satan. This is a prophecy, a clearly a prophecy concerning the literal king of Tyre. Well, Mr. Bible scholar, there is a devil who is in charge of that particular king. Okay? Say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So we're, we know that we're dealing with Satan because later on he talks about how the prince of Tyrus or the king of Tyrus Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was thy covering, and the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So we know that there's not a king, a literal man, sitting on the throne who's got trumpets for arms. Okay? We know that. But we know that there is a anointed cherub who has trumpets, and he's got pipes and he's got tabrets, which is tambourines and percussive instruments and, and organs and trumpets and clarinets and flutes and all this stuff. He's got this literally built into his body. And if you think that's weird and dumb, then think of crickets who make sounds with their wings. And in Ezekiel chapter 1, the four cherubs that carry the throne of God or let's say, what is it? It's in Isaiah 6. But anyway, they make, I'll, I dropped the world. They make sounds with their wings. And their wings sound like the voice of many waters rushing together. So we have worldly creatures that when their wings flap or when their wings rub together, they make noises, they make sounds, they make like cricket sounds or chirping sounds. Angels do the same thing. So I don't have a problem thinking of the devil who has musical instruments built into his body. Ezekiel chapter, turn to Ezekiel 38. Let's spend some time here. Because I was told, does anybody have a um, piece of candy? Like a mint, a peppermint or a butterscotch or something like that. Because my blood sugar just is dropping just like that. Boom, it's that birthday cake. Thank you. Is that sugar? Yeah. Oh, I like these. All right. So I'll know that I'm supposed to be done preaching when this is sucked down to nothing. All right. Is it, huh? Give me another one. All right. Where is Ezekiel? It's after Lamentations. When my blood sugar drops... I don't think very, I don't think well. Uh, Ezekiel 38, hang on. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, put this down. Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against them. Now, Verse 3, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, every prophecy book I've ever read and every prophecy commentary I've ever read said this is Russia. It's Russia. Okay? Now, there is an etymological line that links Meshach with Moscow. 
And I don't doubt that. However, if you read Ezekiel 38, you'll see very clearly that they're going to come down from the mountains on horseback. What army still rides horses as their main method of moving troops? Huh? An angelic one. There is no earthly army that still uses horses to carry troops and to move guns and cannons and chariots and all this stuff. Is it raining out there? Okay. So there isn't, there isn't any army that I'm aware of. We still have, we still use the word cavalry in the American army. He's with the 5th Cavalry, but they, and that refers to guys who ride horseback, but they don't ride horses anymore. Okay? They have armored tanks and troop carriers and planes and everything else, but they don't ride horses anymore. This army rides horses. This army has spears. There isn't an army in the world that would ever even think to use spears or swords or arrows, okay? So, is the Bible outdated? Is Ezekiel seeing something that he doesn't recognize like missiles flying back and forth and bullets and he's just calling them spears? Or is the Bible right? And is, it, is Ezekiel seeing an army that comes in riding on horses using spears, but these are weapons that are far beyond our dimension. Okay? That's what I think. Now, is this linked with Russia? It could very well be. But, you see, I'm getting this from, he calls him Gog, he calls Gog the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I'm going to give you evidence here in a little bit. What that tells me is that this is more a spirit named Gog, who is a chief prince, like Satan is a prince, like Michael is a prince, Gabriel is a prince. These are all prince angels and they have dominion over certain territories. Does that make sense? So, when you read Ezekiel 38, they're going to come against Israel. I'm trying to get some of the sugar in me. Verse 16, Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. God said, when I bring a cloud over the land. He said that in Genesis 9. And when he said that, he said, I'm going to set my bow in that cloud. Well, that bow is Jesus. The token, the covenant, the sign of the covenant is Jesus coming in the clouds. Just like the bow in the clouds. Okay? So... As you're reading Ezekiel 38, 39, by the way, these weapons are going to be burnt because God is going to make this army fail miserably and they're going to take their weapons and it's going to take them seven years to burn these weapons, okay? Again, if these are tanks and guns, you can't just start a fire with them. Okay, so I'm thinking that there's something of a higher dimension as it relates to this. All right, Ezekiel 39, he says the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal is Gog. Gog is the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I'll give you something interesting. There are two entities that are said to be the true rulers of London, England. They are giants called Gog and Magog. 
okay? And they are said to be the true rulers of London, England. Okay? You look into it. I think that it's very possible that you're dealing with spirits, principalities. Gog, who is a chief prince. Magog, a chief prince, and so on. Daniel chapter 8, turn there. Well, I appreciate that candy. That's good stuff. I just have to get rid of it or I'll spit all over Sterling and John and Sandy. Daniel chapter 8. Verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground. That's Revelation 12 in Revelation 6. And stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. The host are the armies of the angels, and there is a prince over these angels. Angels are arranged in military order. They have, there are soldiers, there are, some of them, guess what, are chariots. That's what the Bible says. The chariots are the Lord are 20,000, even thousands of angels. So some of them are Soldiers, some of them are chariots, some of them are horses. And there are chief princes over them. And on the evil angel side, Satan is the chief prince over all the evil angels. They do what he tells them to do. He's the five-star general over all of those evil angels. All right. On the Lord's side, who is the chief prince fighting on the Lord's side? Does anybody know? Michael. Okay. Which is who I was named after. Michael's, the name is Michael, and it literally means who is like unto Elohim or who is like unto God. So this. This particular prince, in verse 11, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Look in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. Let's read a little bit of this story. Verse 11, he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, underline that in your Bible, that is a devil, an angel, who is a prince of the kingdom of Persia. So he is the prince of Persia. There was a movie. Came out um, with Jake Gyllenhaal. And he, it was about, he was, he was referred to as the prince of Persia. Does so you might remember what movie? I was, it's early in his career. Somebody looked at IMDb, imdb.com, find that movie. But he's like, the title of the movie has Prince of Persia in it. It has to do with time. He's like the time guardian or something like that. Dealing with time. And that's interesting because in the book of Daniel, we know that the Antichrist is given. He seeks to change times and laws and they are given into his hand. Okay. So it's kind of scary there. Huh? Anyway. Um, 
Then Daniel chapter 10, look at verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. So here's this angel. And he is, has the answer to Daniel's prayer. And he's sent as an angel. The word angel means messenger. And he's sent to Daniel. But the prince of Persia blocks him for 21 days. This angel, who is a principality over the kingdom of Persia, which is Iran, and I have no reason to doubt that this same angel is still the chief prince over Iran. Okay? Because they don't want the gospel or messengers from God in Iran. They don't want that. So here's an angel sent from God. And this evil angel keeps him 21 days. Will not let him go past. I don't even know what that looks like. Where a spirit... Cannot get around another spirit and God is letting it happen. Because if God wanted to, he could say, uh, excuse me, prince, move out of the way. And he would have to do it. Amen. Don't believe the charismatic fable. That devils only do what you allow them to do. And God doesn't have any choice in it. That's a lie. It's a lie. But God allowed this to go on. The prince of the people of Persia withstood me 21 and 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. Kings of Persia. Multiple angels there. So Michael finally came to give him relief, give him help. Fight somehow. Boy, Michael is one bad John Wayne Clint Eastwood dude. Amen. Don't mess with Michael. I'm glad I'm on his side. Amen. All right, get a t-shirt. Don't mess with Michael. Daniel 10, 13. Then look at Daniel uh, 10, 20. Then said he knows how therefore I come unto thee. And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. Now we got another prince. The one who is over the Greece empire. Alexander the Great. Had a devil that was over him that there is no doubt. Do you know how old Alexander the Great was when he died? 32. He conquered the Medo-Persian Empire just barely into his 30s. Just barely. There's no doubt that this devil aided him in his conquest. Does that make sense? So, and, and I think it's very, very important to understand this. Whenever you're dealing with politics, there are spirits there. Even when, I'll say this, even when churches have business meetings and there's going to be some sort of jostling for control of that church, there are spirits there. Absolutely there are spirits there. Because there are spirits that want to control a church. They're principalities. That's what they do. Daniel 10, 21. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that withholdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Then in Daniel 12, so Michael is the prince of who? What people? Israel. And I guess that would apply also to us, the people of God. Michael is the chief prince of the people of God. Okay, there was, I don't know if you remember or even heard of this, there was a story, I don't know who started it, 
But if you, the Jackson family, from Michael Jackson, Tito Jackson, that whole Jackson 5 family, the Jackson family, their background is Jehovah's Witness. And they, there was a story put out that Michael Jackson was Michael the Archangel. Kid you not. Because the Jehovah's Witness say that Michael the Archangel is Jesus. So here is Michael Jackson, another Jesus. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Apparently he was so busy fighting the prince of Persia, he needed drugs to go to sleep. Heavy drugs. Like knock them out John drugs, all right? Daniel 12, 1, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. So it calls Michael a prince. So understand this. When you're looking in your Bible and you see kings and princes, look at the story, because the story is real, the king is real, but also take it up one level and understand that there's something being taught about spirits. We can't see the spiritual realm with our eyes. The only way we can see how spirits interact or how they act is through the eyes of the scriptures. It's the only way we can know what's going on. All right. Now, uh, Matthew 9. But the Pharisee said he casted out devils through the prince of the devils. We, we read that, Matthew 12, 24. When the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, or Baal, Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. He's talking about a principality. John 14, 30. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. So who is the prince of this world? It's Satan. He is the chief prince over this world. The whole, remember when he took Jesus up into a high mountain, exceeding high mountain. All the kingdoms of the world will I give you. Did he have them? Absolutely. He's the chief prince of this world. Satan has had his hand in every kingdom. Every empire, every throne, Every form of government, he's had his hand in it. Okay? Ephesians 2, 2. Turn there. I want you to see this. I want you to underline it. Very, very important verse in your Bible. Ephesians 2. So when I tell you that I believe devils influence everybody that's lost, here's why. Ephesians 2, 1, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the of the air, the spirit, there's your connection there, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So, who has lost people in their family? Because of that, the prince of the power of the air, a principality, a what we're fighting against, has influence over every lost person person that you know do not be surprised at how if it got serious how they would treat you do not be surprised okay because the devils that have control over these lost people they don't care that you're related to them and that you love them they don't care do animals care about human relationships? Nope. One thing about dogs. Dogs will be loyal to whoever their owner is. And what if their owner 
is an absolute murderer, rapist, dopehead, drunkard, thug. That dog's still going to wag his tail when he comes walking in the door. That dog thinks he's the nicest person in the world. He has no discernment whatsoever. Beast nature is what that is. So as such, lost people in this world, even if they're your family members, even if they're close friends, even if they are preachers, there are devils who influence, I would say, most everything they do in life. There are devils who, even, I'm not saying that they necessarily are possessed. I'm saying that they are influenced to do the things that they do. And do not be surprised when they turn on you. You ever seen someone's visage change right in front of your eyes? That's the spirit. A lady was telling me, she had called me because she had heard some of the videos I'd done about the emerging church and things like that. And she said that the pastor came in, to the, they got a new pastor, and uh, he came in on fire and stirred everybody up, said we're going to build the church and build the church and build the church. And then he started taking people out to California for these Rick Warren teaching seminars. Taking the leaders of the church all the way out to California to Rick Warren to teach them how to build these liberal churches. So this lady started getting on the internet, doing some research about Rick Warren, found some things out about him. She invited the pastor over, and she said, I want to talk to you, for her and her husband, she said, I want to talk to you a little bit. And the pastor said, what? You know, he's all nice friends. I knew the guy. And she said, you're taking these people out to study Rick Warren. And she had some paper, and she said, I would like for you to read these, because he's not who you think he is. And she said, his whole visage changed right in front of her. And from that moment on, that man was absolutely dead set on getting rid of those people out of his church. And it finally came down to him and the deacon went to their house and said, I'm going to ask you guys to leave. You're causing trouble and I can't have that. Okay. And put them out. Basically put them out. I mean, he had no right or authority to just say, I'm kicking you out. Because he didn't have, there was no moral evidence that he had or nothing like that. He just said, I think it's best that you guys go find another church somewhere. And they decided they weren't going to fight it, so they left. But they saw his face change. That is a spirit. There, I'm going to tell you something. There are lost pastors. There are unsaved preachers in pulpits. Teaching things they ought not teach for filthy lucre's sake. And as such, there is a principality that is over them. So, look up on the screen. Any place you have disobedience to God's word, there is a principality who governs that person. And they do according to its will, not their own. And I'm going to add, not I'm going to say not God's will. In essence, er everything is God's will. If it happens, God wanted it to happen. But in other words, he's not following the scriptures and scriptural commandments. Okay? That's what a principality does. I'm going to show you a couple of things and I'm going to let you go. Here is the Vatican. Is there a principality over the Vatican? Multiple ones. You're looking at a picture of them. See all these right here? You know what these are? They're, they're idols. With every idol, there is a devil posing as that deity. These are gods who are the principalities over the Vatican. And here is their main one. This is an obelisk. Another word for it is Baal's shaft. This is an image of Baal. And it's a particular reference to his procreative organ 
This is the principality that governs. You're looking at basically the, the beast, the Antichrist. Okay, that's his symbol. So the Vatican has the spirit of Antichrist as one of its main principalities. Is that hard for you to believe? Okay, I'm, I'm just, I'm making this easy for you. This is the capital of the United States of America. Is there a principality over the Congress, Supreme Court? Okay, this is a statue of a goddess called Liberty or f Freedom. Freedom. Okay, it is a goddess. Inside it, I don't have a picture of it, inside the Capitol Dome is a picture called um, the, uh, what's it called? I just drew a blank. Anyway, it's Washington, George Washington deified as a god. Do what? Apotheosis. Thank you, Sandy. God bless you. I knew Theo was in there somewhere. Apotheosis. Turning George Washington into a deity, into a god. A sp and 13 goddesses surrounding him. Okay, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The Lincoln Memorial was actually designed after the temple of Zeus. Exactly the temple of Zeus. Exactly. This is supposed to be a god sitting in a religious temple. There are 46 pillars. 36 on the outside, 10 on the inside. Dun, dun, dun. Spirits. Here's another one. This is the Washington Memorial. This symbol right here is the symbol for Mystery Babylon. These are the principalities and the spirits. That, by the way, this right here is the same one as what was in the Vatican. Same spirit. Same principality. This is who we're wrestling against. Let me just, I'll talk about this symbol right here and then I'm going to quit. This symbol right here shows the uniting of two things that are opposite each other. What did we just read this morning in Scripture, 2 Corinthians 6? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness Figure this is righteousness, and this is unrighteousness, and they're joined together. Okay? It is the exact opposite of what we believe and stand for as Bible believers. These are the spirits that are working in the senators and the congressmen of disobedience. The judges of disobedience. The presidents of disobedience. This is, who, this is the spirit that rules over them. And we're to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong. I love my country. I love my country. And my country is enabling me and others to continue to preach the gospel. I do not believe in nor preach anarchy. But we have freedom in this country where we wouldn't have this anywhere else. Amen? So I'm not blasting America per se. But it's clear to me when things go wrong or things go awry. In the halls of Congress, in the White House, in the Supreme Court. It is obvious to me that there is principalities that are leading that and are a part of that. Okay? So consider that and think about that and ask yourself, are there principalities? Are there devils who want, let's narrow it down, areas of authority, the home, the church, your business? Are there principalities who would like to work against my home, 
who would like to destroy my home, make things go bad in my home? Are there principalities who would like to destroy this church? Think about it. To me, that's obvious. Okay? And most of the time, I recognize it. It's when things happen and I, don't, I can't figure it out or I don't, didn't see it coming. That's when it really bothers me. But it usually is, I am not the target, but they will start with me. The real target is the people in the congregation. You're the lambs that when the shepherd is smitten, when the sheep get scattered, that means they're running out of the sheepfold and they're just open season for the wolves. Amen? Sandy, God bless you for coming up with that word. That blessed my heart. Appreciate that. All right. All right. Let's go to prayer. You think about what I said, because we're going to get it. We're going here next Sunday night. Going to church next Sunday night. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this teaching. Thank you for the Bible. Lord, the Bible really is the light. And it is the way that we can see things that cannot be seen with our eyes. The Bible then gives us the way that we can see them. And Father, we have story after story after story in the scriptures that are there to show us how the spiritual world really works. How things go on behind the scenes, Father, of areas that we cannot see. And God, give us light, give us understanding. Help us, dear God, to understand that the kind of spirits that are running our nation, the kind of spirits that run TV shows, radio programs, music industry, movie industry, commercial industry, every kind of industry that there is in this country, Lord, there's a spirit, there's a principality that wants things their way to further the agenda of Satan. And Father, just give us eyes to see and give us a heart, Lord, a desire to know what's going on in the world, what's really going on in the world. Father, we may not be able to do anything about it, but at least, Lord, give us light that when it happens close to home, we'll know how to fight it. So bless us, Lord, with our armor that you've given us freely. Thank you, God, for giving it to us. Help us, dear God, to stand in the evil day. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said.